Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, this is the next webinar in a series we are running bi-monthly, uh, covering a number of different topics in the apprenticeship world. Uh, and today we are going to be discussing data analytics in 2021 and beyond. Uh, if you've been on any of our previous webinars, including our data webinar back in August last year, then we're delighted to have you back. And if this is the first you've signed up to, then I hope the next hour is uh, insightful and I hope it's helpful. My name is Paul Crisp. I'll be guiding you through the next hour. And the format of the session will firstly be some comments from our group commercial officer, Lee Dempster. He's going to give a market overview of big data and the rise of the machines. We'll then have a panel discussion uh, led by our client services director, Richard Lambden. We've got some fantastic panelists lined up to give their opinion on the data world. Um, we're also going to have an overview of both of our data apprenticeship programs from Julie Watts and Jeanette Wood, including our brand new level three apprenticeship program, uh, the, the data technician program, the level three program. There's an option for a Q&A after, so please feel free to put any questions into the chat box as this webinar progresses, uh, and we'll look to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Firstly, James, if you can pass over a quick overview of who we are at Just IT and Skills Team. Uh, we are an organisation that cover three areas. We cover IT training, so short courses for individuals. We cover senior IT recruitment and, of course, uh, apprenticeships in both the IT and digital space, uh, as well as leadership and management. We're delighted to be celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. It was our official birthday uh, back in March. Uh, and we did a bit of number crunching around the business and realised that if we added up the years of service in apprenticeships, uh, within our staff, we have over 450 years of experience and uh, and also over 200 years of those um, with, within Just IT. We're also proud of the work we do with our clients. Uh, a couple of those you'll be hearing from later and around 70% of our businesses repeat. Uh, we're very proud to say that we've helped over 10,000 people either start or progress their tech careers in the last 20 years. We also have currently around about 70% of our learners in place with our top 20% partners. And you can see on the right some of the accreditations and partners we work with. And um, before I go to Lee, we're going to do a quick poll. So I'm going to hand over to James to set that up. Over to you, James. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, uh, so I am going to launch the first poll. Uh, and the, the title and the question that we would like you to answer is what trends in data do you anticipate in the next 12 months? And I believe that this first poll is a multiple choice question. So you can choose um, a number of those. So I'm going to launch those right now for you. And that should come onto your screen. So um, we've got more automation in reporting, increased AI, uh, we've got uh, increased concerns about security of data and obviously the need of ethical controls on how data is used to increase public cloud services. So we've got quite a few votes coming in, um, so I would give you another five seconds uh, and I will launch and the results. So we've got five, four, three, two and one so i'm going to close the poll now and i'm going to share with you the results so the results are up on the screen paul um what do you think about those results yeah fantastic thanks very much james so yeah trends that we can see so 71 percent of you uh, quite a lot saying more automation in reporting 59 percent an increase in, in ai and artificial intelligence 65 percent of increased concerns about the security of data absolutely prevalent right now um, 47 percent need for ethical controls and how data is used uh, and the lower part 41 percent in regards to an increase towards public cloud services thank you very much all um hopefully you can see me on the screen now i think i froze early so apologies on that side but i'm going to come off screen in a second i'm going to hand over to lee dempster our group commercial officer he's going to give us a market overview of the data world so lee over to you thanks very much paul thanks for everyone who's doing the poll i think um we'll see some of the results in that in terms of uh, what we found in terms of our white paper. So look, the, the rise of the machines immediately paints this kind of frightening image of the mind, and probably no, no little thanks to the Terminator franchise. But today's world is dominated by data-driven machines, from our laptops, our PCs, our mobile devices, all the way through to our TVs, cars, and the internet of things. But machines are more prevalent when it comes to data, and especially big data. We and, of course, machines are generating so much that powerful computers are required to process and store it, and entire industries are devoted to making sense of it. What is quite scary, depending on your point of view, is that machines are learning. 
through computer algorithms, they automatically upgrade themselves by discovering patterns in existing data without being explicitly programmed to do so. This whole processing of machine learning, rather than being a sinister future vision, is now actually a reality and a requirement in dealing with the mountains of data and information we are producing. Essentially, many of our systems in business and wider society just wouldn't work without data and machines to process it, and of course, humans, data analysts, data scientists, to make sense of it. So some interesting facts about big data. The numbers are truly mind-boggling. When we talk about data and the growth of the big data, it's a phenomenon. When we were doing this paper, you know, it's what's 25 followed by 17 zeros. Well, it's two and a half quintillion, and I'd never heard of that. Uh, most people haven't, but that's what users of the internet generate in bytes of data each day on average. Social platforms have continued to explode in terms of usage. And if you looked at something like WhatsApp, it's sending 65 billion messages per day. They have over 2 billion users and over 5 million companies using the platform. The global finance sector has increased spending on big data infrastructure by $18 billion in the last five years. If you took all of the information that was on the internet, it would take a person to download all of that data 181 million years to do so. But equally in the day-to-day -day world, Films are watched by users based on Netflix's machine learning algorithms. Approximately 75% of Netflix users select films recommended to them by the company's machines, which helps deliver $1 billion in customer retention. But did you know that data is sexy? Well, in 2012, Harvard Business Review hailed data science as the sexiest job of the 21st century. And this seemed like an exaggerated view back then. But fast forward to today, and every business wants to employ data scientists of some type. The value of data, or more accurately, the value of the insights that it offers, have now been realized by many. The field of data science covers many disciplines, data analysis, informatics, AI, machine learning, numerical analysis, so on and so forth. More than anything, what data scientists do is make discoveries from data. They're comfortable in the digital economy and able to bring structure to large quantities of formless data. In a competitive landscape where the data never stops flowing, data professionals help decision makers shift their focus to ongoing customer signals that come from that data. Forbes reported that 95% of businesses cite that the need to manage unstructured data is a problem for their business. And their CIOs highlighted that 80, 90% of the data we generate today is still unstructured. The challenge has been accelerated with faster mobile networks, leading to increased usage. IBM reports that 90% of all data has been created in the last couple of years. This all supports the argument that skilled data professionals and more computer machine power will be required as we move through the 2020s. It's predicted that 97.2% of organizations are investing in big data and job listings for data science and analytics will reach around 3 million jobs in 2021. But it's insights from data that is so important. Data science extracts knowledge uh, and insights from that data often information that just wouldn't be available from one set of data. The term big data refers to data that is so large and fast or complex that it's difficult or impossible to use it using traditional methods. The roots of data science are in scientific methods and algorithms, and these are rigorously used. The output has to be verified as plausible. Key aspects are based on the ability to evaluate extremely large data sets that may be analyzed computationally to reveal patterns and trends and associations, especially relating to human behavior and interactions. Ultimately, the aim is to better understand customers. Data gives direction on what customers need and want. As mentioned earlier, Netflix, for example, is using data to nurture customer loyalty. 
company itself saves £1 billion per year in customer retention over its 100 million subscribers. They're collecting huge amounts of data from their users and it's key to their retention strategy. If you're a subscriber of Netflix, and probably most of us have been in the last uh, three lockdowns, you're familiar with how you, they are sending you suggestions on what the next movie is that you should watch. And this is done by using past search and watch data, key insights on what interests the subscriber the most. For many companies, consumer data offers a way to understand and better understand that customer behavior and how to improve the customer experience. Data such as reviews and feedback are used nimbly to modify digital presence, goods and services to better suit the current marketplace. If you think about Amazon, how they've expanded their business using data, they're in retail, they're in cloud computing, they're in advertising, and they're continuously developing products and services to capture different markets. Contextualized data can help companies understand how consumers are engaging with and responding to their marketing campaigns, and they can adjust accordingly. This highly predictive use gives businesses an idea of what consumers want and what they've already done. Mapping user journeys and personalizing that journey and segmenting data effectively means that companies market to people who are more likely to engage with them. This, of course, helps transform data into cash flow. So what's next for the future of data? We love generating it. We love generating data in a value exchange with corporations to use their services. And corporations love using data, our data, to help them make decisions. Data volumes will continue to increase and they will migrate to the cloud, as we saw in the poll. It's very much the, what's on people's minds. Most big data experts agree that the amount of generated data will grow exponentially in the future. In a Data Age 2025 report uh, for Seagate, IDC forecasts that the global data sphere will reach 175 zettabytes by 2025. Machine learning will continue to change the landscape. Experts believe that computers' ability to learn from data will improve considerably due to the more advanced unsupervised algorithms, deeper personalization and cognitive services. As a result, there will be machines that are more intelligent and capable of reading emotions, driving cars, exploring space, treating patient, patients. The investment in this area is huge. Data scientists and chief data officers will be in high demand. The positions of data scientists and CDOs are relatively new, but the need for these specialists in labor markets are already extremely high. In 2019, KPMG surveyed 3,600 CIOs and technology executives from 108 countries and found that 67% of them have already started struggling with skill shortages with the top three scarcest skills being big data slash analytics, security, and artificial intelligence. So being fascinating and frightening at the same time, the future of big data analytics promised to change the way businesses operate in finance, healthcare, manufacturing, and other industries. The overwhelming size of big data may create additional challenges in the future, including data privacy, security risks, shortage of data professionals, and difficulties in how that data is stored and processed. However, most agree that big data will mean big value. It will give rise to new job categories and even entire departments responsible for data management in large organizations. This means that if an organization is to benefit from the use of data, they need to find the right data specialists and quickly. As UK firms are indicating their strongest hiring intentions in over the last couple of years, a data focused talent drain is coming. So have a think about how you would deal with this and will data be your heaven or will it be your help? Thank you very much, Lee. Yes, will it be your data heaven or will it be your data hell? Food for thought there for our panel. 
Uh, I'm going to invite our client services director, Richard Lambden, to come on screen now. Uh, he's going to lead the panel discussion for the next 25 minutes or so. So, Richard, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can see me. I can't see myself, so I can't tell if you can see me on screen or not, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, so, if, one by one, if I could uh, invite the, the panellists to join us today, come up on camera and uh, just say a few words about themselves. So, Rashang, would you like to come up first, please, or, or join us uh, on the panel? Good afternoon, everyone. So there's there's always one person who has technical issues when it comes to webinars, and today, unfortunately, that is me. So you, you unfortunately won't see my face. But I hope you can hear me loud and clear. So loud and clear, we can. Just... We can indeed. Good stuff. So you good want stuff. To say so, a little bit about yourself, so in your background. Yeah. So my name is Shane Kwaku Price. I am the apprenticeships and work experience coordinator at Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, so my journey into my working career started as a data analyst on an apprenticeship and now it's come full circle where I have managed apprenticeships but today representing data analysis. Fantastic and, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, Patricia, would you like to, to join us and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody, hopefully you can see me and hear me. Uh, yeah, so I work, BCS. Uh, I work at BCS as Senior Product Manager. My role is to oversee the development, the design, the way in which our qualifications perform. So, so I'm here to kind of give that view of um, yeah, the qualification side and that kind of thing. Superb, thanks for your time. Josh, would you, would you like to come up and, and introduce yourself? Hey, um, hello, I'm Josh. I'm a data quality officer at Guys and St. Thomas Hospital for audiology and hearing implants. Um, we, uh, the, the reason the role exists is uh, because audiology and hearing implants have quite a lot of very complex um, uh, software that sits outside of the standard hospital software, uh, which I'm in charge of managing and bringing that data back in line with the um, hospital informatics team. Uh, I'm invited to the panel because I'm currently actually on the Just IT Data Apprenticeship Level 4. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'll be talking about that. Wonderful. So we've got a past apprentice who's now an apprenticeship lead. We've got a current apprentice. So um, feel free to stay on camera, Josh. Um, oh. Michael, would you like to, to join us as well, please? Hi, um, yes, my name's Michael. Um, I'm the Safety Informatics and Datex Manager at the Royal Free London. Um, so I'm responsible for looking after the patient safety and patient experience software. Um, and I manage uh, an apprentice who's working with Just IT. Fantastic. And, and, and uh, I think uh, you were so inspired by great work that Gareth has done that you've undertaken an apprenticeship yourself I think and you're doing a master's aren't you a level seven so it's a great yeah. great to get this story. Yeah that's correct. Um, and last yeah. but not least um, Paul would you like to, to join us from Haze Travel? Hi there I'm Paul I uh, head up all of the data and software development at Haze Travel so um, on the data side we look after our enterprise data warehouse and using data to inform decisions from the board level down and um, and also to build software to use data to drive business processes and automate those. Um, on well, the apprentice front, on the apprenticeship front, I was just going to say we've just been having conversations about starting to bring our first apprentices into the team. Yeah, so I hope, hopefully, um, and obviously, it's, it's fantastic. We've got such a wide-ranging panel. We've got, uh, you know, we've got current apprentices, past apprentices, managers of apprentices employers and, and subject matter expert in Patricia. So I think we've got every base covered. And um, if we can start by just reflecting, and my, my picture seems to have frozen again, so uh, apologies, but I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, the, the poll results that, that kind of came out, and I think it will then lead nicely into um, the, the discussion. Was there any kind of surprises there? It was just to remind you, 71% thought there'd be more automation in reporting. 59% thought there'd been an increase in, in the use of AI, 65% increased concerns about data, 47% um, need better controls or ethical controls on how data is used, and 41% anticipate an increase towards public cloud services. I, I guess if we come to people are kind of in that space, Michael, is, is that kind of reflective of what you're, you're finding? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it wasn't too much of a, a surprise for me to see the automation fire um, there because uh, that's definitely reflective of our world at the moment that we're working on on a day to day basis. Um, so we're, we're uh, obviously we're looking after patient safety data and um, it's important to the clinicians and board level. So we're getting lots of interest in in how we can automate that data to make sure people really have it at their fingertips and are able to find it easily and share that information with their teams and especially during the pandemic um, that data became quite important to see trends and what was going on across the hospital so the easier it was to access for people the the better the better it was it's definitely of our day-to-day -day at the moment when you and I had a kind of a, a call um, to prepare for this webinar, you were telling me that the Gareth, who is your, your the apprentice that you referred to, um, had done such a good job that he was kind of getting more and more interest from managers because the information he was providing was was useful for them to make informed decisions. You, you were telling me that that you think has led to automation, the sense of almost self serve uh, reporting for managers. How, how's that progressing? Yeah, it's 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 been actually because um, so Gareth has been working quite closely with, with lots of different cl clinical teams and um, from his experience as well with the data uh, and from doing his apprenticeship he, he's been able to advise people on what the best way to present their information um, so people will often come to us with an idea of what they want and actually um, what they want and what they're asking for are quite often slightly different um, and we have to do a little bit of work in the middle to try and marry that up. And, and Gareth's been brilliant at being able to suggest the best way to display that information, set these dashboards up for them, um, which means they can see all of that information um, locally um, and we can guide them through how to access that and, and to use it easily. So it, it's, it's really made their life easier um, to be able to go to somebody and talk, talk it through um, yeah. and then to set something up and then just be able to go to that information straight away. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, Paul, when um, when we were talking, you were explaining some of the things that you've had to do in the last kind of 12, 14 months um, to kind of cope during the, the pandemic. Um, you know, I think we had conversation around data warehouses and what you've done with the the kind of refund system and, and bringing the direct debit in-house. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we've got, we've got the um, report and automation, obviously, but there's, um, as I mentioned before, we do business process automation as well. So the um, one thing we've done a lot of in the last year is refund customers for holidays that they were going to go on. Um, and we were hitting a peak last summer of around five million pounds a week of refunds going through. Wow. Um, and up in, up until uh, March last year, the refund process was always manual. Uh, only a small percentage of people cancelled, but um, but we hit a point where everybody was cancelling because they couldn't go on holiday. So we we had the data there to know when the holiday was cancelled because it couldn't fly and um, whether the supplier had given us the money back so we could return it to the customer and how the customer paid and so on. So we built a system around that to automate that process. So when the cancellation was processed and we received the confirmation from the supplier, the sales agent in the shop just had to click a button. We'd read the data in. Um, we would know how the customer paid and therefore how we would refund them if they paid by card. We could just automate that because we can just send transaction number to the bank. Um, if they paid by another means, we could ask them to securely submit their bank details via our website, and that would tie it up with a refund request, and then automate an output to our bank to to send that payment as well. And that helped us achieve um, a really high rate of refunds through. Um, and uh, I believe we did quite well in the uh, money saving expert poll as well for uh, for customer refunds at the time because. Um, not everybody was able to achieve such a high rate because of the manual work involved. And as far as we know, we're the only travel agent that's managed to build an automated system to do that. Well, I think fair, fair play to you, because I know there's been lots of uh, disquiet, shall we say, haven't there, from from disgruntled customers who haven't been able to uh, to do that. So so that's fantastic. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Rashan, um, you were telling me that your when you did your data apprenticeship, you were in the financial services 
um, sector, I think. And and you were doing your work was around uh, this was kind of pre-COVID, getting people to take up online banking. I think. Do you, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah. So that that was when I was working um, at, at HSBC, and that was within the customer relationship management team. So we we were heavily responsible for using big data as it was just starting out back in 2015. Um, to, to generate targeted ads for our um, customers that they were that they were likely to be taken up. The, to the use of data was huge in just being able to ethically push out things that, that people would be likely to go for. And, and did that was that a kind of you know did that result in a big uptake that the work that you were doing your analysis? Uh, yeah, so the by, by collecting the patient, uh, not patient, sorry, back in my NHS world. Collecting both the customer data and then trying that out to our um, senior leaders led to a, a lot more uptake. And then we also did a lot of analysis on the results and, of course, the profits that came about from that. And the, the benefits were huge. That was back when big data was just starting out. So it, it, it really did show where, show where it could lead to, especially from a profit-based organization. Fantastic. Thank you. Josh, I know, I know um, obviously, you're, you're absolutely in kind of patient-critical uh, work that, that you're doing. Um, I think you, you've um, you, you've similarly got some examples of automation, but you're also about to, to roll out the, the, the kind of NHS system epic. So do, do you want to chat a bit about that? Yeah, so for automation, to, to echo what Michael was saying, um, uh, as part of the apprenticeship actually, it was um, where I noticed that a lot of what the um, stakeholders within the department were asking me for was actually something that could be automated and so I built the software well, I built the um, the code so that they could run the reports themselves and set it up so that they could actually get data that they wanted in a usable way I think previously before my job existed that that really wasn't happening um, and we have uh, like any clinical software we have loads and loads and loads of data points but not necessarily any thread to sort of pull that data together in a useful way um, and that's something yeah. that i think is really important to work on especially through automation as you said um, in regards to epic uh what is quite interesting about epic is that so we're still on the an old patient management system called pims um, and we're moving towards epic in hopes to be able to automate a lot more things um epic's a, a bit more free in what it can and can't do it's a bit more flexible and one thing that we're really yeah. hoping to do and something i'm working on quite heavily at the moment is creating pipelines that will actually take the data from our software as i said that sits a bit outside of the general hospital um software at the moment and pipes line it in so that they can uh so it's much easier to read for informatics teams and things like that fantastic thank you and patricia i know um i think it was 59 percent um thought that ai um was going to be more important and this is something that, that you and i had a conversation um about didn't you and, and, and particularly you know referencing back to lee's white paper in terms of kind of machine learning um, it, it, are you seeing that in terms of your wider brief of BCS? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, we're very much focused on the kind of supporting people to be um, understanding data and its impact, I suppose, is is important. I think it's, you know, from the panel that we've got on today, the, the variety of industries that data impacts and the, and the variety of ways in which it can be used. And then the speed in which things are becoming automated that's so reliant on data, the, the data being accurate, the data being um, right and fit for purpose so that that automation is correct. You know, I know Lee spoke about Netflix and, and the way in which it kind of um, produces is something that you could potentially watch and that's all learned from the things that you're already watching informs that um, decision so if that information going in isn't accurate the automation won't be accurate so the two are so intertwined and so important to um, understand and be able to work for that automation to work and I think it was Lee who said you know it's not a future thing it's a right now thing so we need to really get on top of how that how that all works and how that all links together um, and then understand where that human needs to fit into that because the, the data is here the automation is here and coming thick and fast what do we need to do as humans and for me uh, part of that and it, and it works really well with the apprenticeship is those 
or the skills that people need to have then to inform and support and be able to um, explain how things are working. So really add that added value as a human and let the um, computer Patricia, yeah, information do its sorry, work. Sorry, I've frozen again so you can't see me, but taking that a step further then, do, do you have any concerns um, I, I know you will touch, touch on it a little bit later in terms of how you're how you are helping to professionalize the data industry, if I can put it like that. But do you have any concerns with the explosion of data that that is that there is? I don't know. How should we say integrity or you know? Obviously, we talked about security, but I think you know the integrity and the use of data. And I'll come to you, Paul, on that one in a second as well. But are you seeing that as, as something that your members are, are worried about? Yeah, I mean, one concern that probably strong, strong words in terms of it's not, it doesn't have to be that kind of, there's a worry, there's a concern here. It's about what we need to do about it. And, and there is the data security and that's why there's legislation in place and there's things that people need to follow. So, you know, we can train people to understand data protection laws and that type of thing. But it is about the um, there is the ability, if it's not governed right and if the training's not done correctly and we've not got the checks and balances in place, there's the, there's the um, ability for people to use data in the wrong way. So because we're reliant on it and we're reliant on that information, there's the ability for people um, to take that information either on purpose, so to manipulate or by accident, that has a real knock-on impact on the decisions that are then made. You know, we're there's so many places in where that can happen and that's why the the real training of people is so important but equally that whole uh, governance that sits around it is so incredibly important okay so thank you patricia paul in terms of when you were creating the the systems that you kind of spoke about clearly um you know integrity of data is critical you know, i'm sure customers wanted their money back but you know, was that a consideration for you? Was it was it something you were concerned about? Absolutely, especially in um, in terms of collecting bank details, because that was the the point where we were open there. So um, it was done via our website on a on a secure page. Um, but we also had to um, let the customer know that it was a secure way to submit their bank details as well. And we started out by sending them a unique link via text, and and one of the people who received that text, one of our customers was an IT manager and contacted us and said, this looks like phishing. Uh, well, it, it wasn't, but our concern was, well, we might normalize phishing attempts by saying, well, actually, this one's legitimate. Maybe another text you received might be. So we changed the approach to give written instructions on where to go on our website so that they would visit our website separately. Um, but yep. the other the other concern around that as well, and I think is generally our concern when it comes to data security, we can very easily control security from a system perspective but when you get people involved that's where we have issues um because we all make mistakes and don't always do things right and um, so people might for example take a customer's bank details in that context and write them down um or or people can gather data and put it somewhere where it's not in our governed system and um we have not in terms of data security but we have a bit of an issue in terms of processes with um use of a it's a software called Smartsheet at the minute, and everyone here has traveled loves Smartsheets. And they're setting up processes and recording data in there, and we're losing control of not only where the data is, but the structure of it. So um, so it's very much that side of it as well. But we have to consider, going back to the refund process, where people might not put it into the system, no matter how robust we make that system. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Josh and Michael, I'm gonna to come to you. Um, and talk a little bit about kind of data sets. Um, I was talking to a, to a new customer this week um, who is in the in the rail industry, and um, they, they were particularly analysing, you know, clearly passenger safety and, and transportation is, is critical. But I would I would imagine in the NHS it's 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 you know doubly doubly critical. So you know if and Patricia touched on this, if you've got an incomplete set of data, then clearly the, the decisions you're going to make are going to be wrong, aren't they? So how how do you ensure, Josh, that the data set that you're using is is complete and accurate. Therefore, your your customers, your stakeholders, are making the right decisions. 
Um, so I think from from my perspective, I, I, it's just through using making sure that our reports are as robust as possible in what we're actually reporting and giving to the informatics team and presenting to our stakeholders. I think in a wider perspective in the NHS, I think it's through trust directives and things like that, that um, because the importance of data at, at every level, so from making sure that patients are um, everything that we have in their sort of standardized system is completely accurate all the way through to um, tracking their pathway and things like that. All, all parts of that data, um, all parts of that pathway are incredibly important. And all of the, those data sets are really important. And I think all trusts at the moment, there's a real big push towards getting that as accurate as possible. Um, at, at every level, whether it's um, talking to patients directly and getting their information up as um, quickly as possible, or actually, and as efficiently as possible, or actually when you're looking from our perspective on the data teams, looking at, um, well, how, how good is our reporting? How, um, how well automated is it? But also how accurate is the data that it's actually giving to us if we look at the clinical management systems and say what Josh have any of the techniques you learned on the apprenticeship kind of help with that I mean I, I think yeah yeah some from of the, my you know, the, the workshops yeah, from my point of view, the workshops have really helped with scope of knowledge. So I had uh, SQL experience previously, and that's what all of our systems are based on. But actually, the um, the extra knowledge I've learned from uh, R and Python and things like that through the course has really, really helped me in looking at better ways to uh, um, look at the quality of our data and things like that and actually check that things that we had assumed were always accurate in the past whether or not they actually are and looking at that um, in, a, in a greater detail has been something that the course has really helped me with. Great so Michael in terms of sort of same similar questions to you then so um, you know how do you and, and Gareth and the rest of your team kind of in, a, ensure that the correct data sets are used and you know how have you seen the apprenticeship impact, you know, Gallus apprenticeship, but you know, talk about your own as well, if you will. How has that impacted in the way that the teams run? Um, yeah, I think there's probably for us, there's probably kind of three strands um, to it. Um, the first of which um, Gareth has been quite involved in, and that that was around setting up um, a governance process and some standardisation of how we actually set up reports and these dashboards for people we work with. Um, to make sure that we are doing it in the same approach each time. Um, so we have some documentation that we, put in and we keep track of um, and it kind of works as a bit of a change control process. So um, if anybody was to look back in six months time, we can still see exactly how those reports were made, what the fields in them are. If we need to yep. tweak it, we have everything documented. So that's that's been quite a big improvement um, that would be helpful. Um, in terms of actually checking the dashboards are correct as well and that we're not missing any data, um, we also have our own set of dashboards internally that we've set up to look for any gaps in our data um, and that allows us to go and we, we check those weekly and monthly um, to make sure that there's no gaps in the data that we're then sharing with other people. Um, and I think um, that the third strand of it is uh, that we actually now work closely with other departments <laughs> hospital to to make sure that we're doing things in a standardized approach so for example to make sure that we have the hierarchy of the organization um, the same as the finance structures do um, and any other reporting or software systems across across the hospital so that way when we're talking about um, locations or departments we're doing it in exactly the same way as everybody else's and when we come to combining data um, there's no gaps or missing departments or locations or people calling them different things um, it's much more standard uh, in, in the approach so I think that's been really helpful as well. Thank, thank you brilliant. Thank you. Rosh if I can bring you back in in terms of perhaps change, changing tax slightly here I mean just out of interest how, how did how did you get into data what attracted you when you um, did your your apprenticeship um, a few years ago what why did you take up that particular career? Um, yeah, so so when I, when I left school, um, like a lot of young people these days, um, I, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with my career um, for, for the rest of my life. But I did know for a fact that I was into numbers and IT. Those were two things that interested me throughout school. So I didn't, I didn't commit to going to university, but I was very um, interested in doing an apprenticeship. And luckily the apprenticeship opportunity came up. And I think that's 
just one of the, the best things about apprenticeships is it if I if I were to have been looking for a data analyst role, I wouldn't have been accepted because I didn't have the experience. But an apprenticeship yeah. allows you to gain that experience on the job as well as become accustomed to the skills. So yeah, that's how I got started. So that kind of love and numbers certainly kind of helped in in that particular field. Thank you, Rosh. Patricia, extending that further, then um, you know somebody coming in at kind of a, a data tech type level which is the starting point these days in terms of apprenticeship where, where could somebody we've, we've got not just employers but potential candidates on the call as well so where could somebody's career go from a starting point as a data technician i suppose the the, the um, easiest way to answer that i suppose is we don't know as yet do we because the data and the way in which it is changing so very rapidly the roles that will be available in the next five to ten years are not here yet so the idea that <laughs> And train as a data tech and that's and that would be it that would be you done the same as kind of you know in the olden days you you trained to do a job and that was you done you just did the same thing over and over again that's completely completely gone so you can start as data technician you can move all the way through that to become that data scientist to start to get involved in artificial intelligence training those machines you know the, the scope is is endless, I suppose, is what I'm really trying to say, and will continually evolve because data is going nowhere. It is the absolute. Um, it, it's the new. I think they say it's the new oil. Don't it's the new money. It's it's the way in which businesses are going to operate. So we're going to need everybody with an understanding of data, and there's some real um, people with real specific. Um, understanding. I think it's really great that um, Roshane said then about having that kind of eye for detail and that kind of eye for numbers and that type of thing. Traditionally, people would think about maybe accountancy or working in that type of traditional role. They are the skills that we need in data. So those similar types of real accuracy, eye for detail, um, num numerate, those types of skills are absolutely what's required in data. So if you've got just, those skills, just Fantastic. And just quickly, because I'm conscious of uh, two or three minutes more of that. Of the, no, no, that wasn't a, a dig at you at all. But in terms of what BCS is doing to kind of professionalise um, the industry, I know there's things like the Data Science Alliance and the Digital and uh, Data Technology Professional Framework, these these sorts of things. So briefly talk about what those those for me. Yeah, of course. So BCS are um, a part of the Data Science Alliance, along with people like the Royal Statistics Society, the Institute of Mathematics, and that is all about professionalising the, the, the industry. And it's about making sure that there is, that the public can trust the information that's coming out from, from people working in data. The same way as I used accountancy previously as an example, but the same way that we trust accountants and banking professionals, finance professionals, that they're giving the right advice. We need that for data. We need to make sure that the public can trust uh, the information that's being given because all of our decisions are being made via that data. Uh, so we're a part of that. Equally, as BCS, you know, we've got the chartership that we have, the CITP, uh, which is a high level chartership that people can aim for. Uh, and the RIT tech, which you can get as part of the apprenticeship, which then says to people, not only have I got a fantastic apprenticeship, I've also now got my competency validated as being a real trusted professional. So things like RIT tech are so important in that kind of professionalising and offering that trust in these people. Thank you very much. And I'm going to give the final word, if I may, for, uh, to, to Josh, Michael and, and Roche. And it's the same question to each of you. You know, What impact has, has an apprenticeship programme either had on you personally or, or in your kind of department and company? If I can start with you, you Josh. So what I wanted to add on my personal, sorry, I got a bit lost on the question because it cut out. Sorry. sorry. So, so how has the apprenticeship personally helped you or, or your organisation? Um, oh. and I guess you know, would you would you recommend it to, to somebody else if they're considering that as a as a route? So for for me personally, with it because I've got a background in maths and science uh, with what I did my degree in and stuff. So what it helped me with uh, personally was scope of knowledge. That was something that I was really missing, um, and it helped me get far more confident in a lot of. Um, 
different uh, softwares and stuff that I'd never used before. So that was something that I found really, really helpful. And I, yes, I would, I would definitely recommend it to people. Um, not necessarily in my roles, because I think actually data is really important at lots of different levels. So I, I would recommend these sorts of friendships for um, a variety of different professionals, not necessarily with sort of data in the name. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, so so um, Gareth, who's been doing the apprenticeship with Just IT, I think he is. It's really kind of what Josh has just said. It's given him sort of different ways of thinking and using data, um, which has been really great for for us for him to come back with with ideas on how we can do things differently. So that's been really powerful. And and obviously, um, like you touched on at the start, it's also um, encouraged me to actually go and find an apprenticeship myself because. I think the, the great thing about apprenticeships is the fact that you're learning, but you can also put that learning into practice in the workplace as well. So um, it's applicable, and, and for someone like me, that really helped me to actually engage with the learning um, because it's relevant to what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that's that's a great thing about apprenticeships. Thank you, Thank you very much. And Rosh, final word to you, sir. Um, so how, how has it helped you? I know you've kind of gone from an apprenticeship into being an apprenticeship lead, but yeah, final word to you. Um, yeah, just just to echo what Josh and uh, Michael are saying, they're, they're great for helping you establish the key skills for your role. But I, I think one area which is some, sometimes looked over is just just being able to be in the workplace, especially for someone that is new to a role, taking on an apprenticeship. Um, you, you gain so many soft skills just, just from being in an office environment or where, wherever you're working and that you're able to pick up and use in your future role. And that's that's one thing that's allowed me to have become the apprentice lead as I'm, as I'm now. Um, would I recommend it? Um, that is the foundation of my role. So yes, you definitely should consider an apprenticeship. Um, <laughs> a great way to start your career or indeed build on your current development. Fantastic. So it just remains for me to thank um, all five of you for really informative uh, conversation. Um, if you'd like to go on mute and come off camera and I'll hand back to you, Paul, for the next uh, presenters. Thank you very much, Richard. That was a fantastic panel session. Really enjoyed that. So informative. Thank you very much all for being part of that. Um, I'm going to hand over now to our service delivery manager, Julie Watts and Jeanette Wood, our quality and curriculum lead at Just IT. Uh, they're going to give you an overview of both the data apprenticeship programmes we now offer. So, uh, Julie, over to you. Just before you do that, Paul, just while Julie and Jeanette are coming up, um, I'm just going to throw a quick poll in because I just think it's the right time after that informative panel um, to throw a bit of a, a poll in uh, that might actually give some insight to both the next presenters in what our audience are thinking. So guys and girls, um, the next poll that we've got is which apprenticeship level is, uh, is most of interest to your organisation? Um, because there are uh, many uh, sort of levels within uh, the apprenticeship scheme now, which is absolutely fantastic. We talked about level three and four, and you know, uh, we've got uh, one of our panelists is that's doing a, a higher degree uh, apprenticeship. So I'm going to launch this. This is only a single uh, choice uh, one for you. So I'm going to launch that right now. And if you can just select which one that you think is more uh, relevant to your organization, might be within your team. Um, so we've got, you know, the level three, the newest uh, uh, kid in the block, which is the level three data technician the level four data analyst, level six data science degree, or effectively a combination of all, because you may have a, a, a list of different opportunities within all your organization. Oh, this is, we're getting lots of votes here, so I'll give you another five more seconds before I close, launch, and hand over to uh, the, the ladies in operations. So five, four, three, two, one. And I'm going to close that and share the results. Um, and the results are 42% uh, data analyst level four, 11% uh, data technician level three. I think that would actually increase uh, once we do explain the program. I think we'll get a hell of a lot of people that would take that up. At level uh, six, I think we are we are seeing a lower uh, amount of levels for the higher end um, because of commitment. Um, but effectively, you know, there's there's a, quite a lot of people that are saying there's a combination of all. So interesting data there. So um, let me um, ask uh, Julie and Jeanette to come on to our screens um, and we will take you through some of the programs within data that Just IT offer. So Julie and Jeanette, if you can come up, that would be great. 
Thank you, James. Um, if we can just go back to the slide deck, that would be brilliant. Great stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you today, um, what I'm going to talk you through today is the uh, level three and the level four apprenticeship. So we're going to give you some more information. So to start with, uh, we're going to take you through the learner journey for the data technician program. So if we could kindly move to the next slide. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so the Data Technician Programme is our Level 3 programme. Um, and the way I like to describe it to uh, our clients and our learners is that it's an equivalent really to a Level 3, which is like an A-level. Um, but the difference is obviously you're in an employer and you're getting hands-on experience. So the learner journey that you can see on the screen is made up of nine milestones and it's a combination of workshop training and uh, a building and developing of a learner portfolio. OK, so let's start off with milestone one. So once the learner joins the programme, essentially, they'll start with an onboarding and induction pro pro uh, session. Um, the learner will get a uh, welcome to program session with their coach and we'll take them through an overview of the apprenticeship again um, just so uh, that they know what the know what's to be expected of the course and what they're going to be doing for the next 18 months of their um, time on the apprenticeship so if we're looking through the milestones and how the apprenticeship is built is that we start initially start off with some um, more basic workshops and build their knowledge um, into the tools um, that we would use uh, potentially data analysts would use within their roles okay so starting off with more theory-based workshops if we're looking at milestone two two which can consists of data structures and um, the data analyst life cycle essentially um, and then we we start off with uh, the analytical side of Excel and some workshop training within that within those areas the reason we start off with that is that the majority of the le learners that we're expecting to join the data technician program will predominantly be using Excel um, and using analytical tools within Excel. So we, we start off with that um, just so that, that that will get them used to the kind of workshops and the tools that they'll be using as they progress throughout their apprenticeship. Now, as you can see, as you move along the milestones um, and um, you can see that they'll do variations of different workshops in SQL, um, then they're moving on to kind of Power BI, visualization of data, with Tableau and all the way to Milestone 5 which takes you to kind of like R and Python. Um, these are all foundation level workshops so they'll be covering the basics of those tools because we're expecting that a lot of the learners that are joining the level 3 may not have had exposure to those data analyst tools within their job role yet um, so we'll be taking them through the basic levels of those tools um, and as they progress through those workshops they'll be building their portfolio so if we're moving on to milestone six um, which is where the workshops um, essentially finish um, by month 15 they'll be building their portfolio um, and evidencing what they're learning throughout the apprenticeship and building the knowledge that they're learning on the workshops into their portfolio, and which is essentially um, embedding how they've taken that knowledge from the workshop into their job roles. So by, by month 14, sorry, 15 or 14, they should have a completed portfolio and they should have finished all of their training and workshops. Um, then we're moving on to the endpoint assessment. So endpoint assessment is essentially us handing over the learner to BCS to be assessed. So we're saying to BCS that we the learner has gone through their training um, and all the milestones of their apprenticeship. And we now think that they are ready in terms of skills, knowledge and behaviour to be assessed by BCS. So the endpoint assessment takes them through a scenario demonstration with questioning with a BCS assessor um, and then they'll also have a BCS discussion or interview um, based on their portfolio that they've been building over the last uh, 15 months essentially um, and then by month 18 they'll receive their grade so the grades that you can get uh, whilst training on the apprenticeship is a pass a merit or distinction now as an additional offer um, on the new standards that are being launched as of the 1st of June there's no exams that are included within um, 
the program. However, we can advise and recommend some exams that fit in well with our apprenticeship that is also can be on offer to you also. So if we want to move to the next program, which is the Data Analyst Level 4. So just to take you through the journey, um, it's very similar in the way that we set up um, our workshops and how we embed the knowledge into the portfolio um, so that the learner can evidence how their skills, the skills that they've learned with us within the apprenticeship, sorry. So um, we start them off with, um, again, theory kind of based um, life cycle of data analytics. So looking at data analytics within and how that adds business value within their organization. Then we follow up into the same kind of format, so data visualization, and then we get into the, the tools. So on the level four, the difference is that you're bringing them up a level to, to advanced. Um, so you're looking at SQL, R and Python in a more advanced level. And then again, by month 14, um, they should have finished all their workshops. Now we've added in MongoDB as an optional because we know that some employers are um, finding that this uh, database is quite attractive at the moment. So that is an optional uh, workshop that we're including. There's no cost for that, um, but it's not directly linked to the knowledge, skills or behaviours on the standards, but we thought it'd be nice, nice to have for our employers and learners. And then again, by month 15 to 16, we'll move them into endpoint assessment. Um, the EPA process for the level four is slightly different in the sense that the, the line manager and the apprentice and the coach will uh, support the, um, will build a project, sorry, a, a project that will fit in with the organization and shows the skill set of the apprentice and everything that they've learned for the last, um, throughout their duration on the apprenticeship. And um, the coach will help by the learner and the line manager to build this project in the sense of picking an idea or a topic that suits well with the organization. And then the BCS assessor will have an interview um, once the learner has completed that project and they'll ask some questions um, about the project um, and how the learner um, utilize data and how they utilize their skills within that project. And then they'll also have a secondary interview with a BCS assessor based on their portfolio that they've build, been building for throughout the time on their apprenticeship. Now the grading is the same, um, pass, merit or distinction. Um, and hopefully by the end of the apprenticeship, they've been taken from an intermediate to advanced level on the in, in, in terms of their knowledge, skills and behaviours. So um, if we move to the next slide, Jeanette is gonna take you through the differences, the key differences between the level three and level four. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. I, uh, my name is Jeanette and I'm the, the quality and curriculum lead for uh, the data pathways. I am the internal quality assurer, so the IQA, so quality is, is what I'm about to make sure that the learner and the coach actually have a good learning journey and that they meet the needs of the standards and the quality that we expect uh, from uh, the employer, the learner and the um, the coach and the awarded body. So the difference between level three and level four, is, the endpoint assessment is at level three, um, it is a, a scenario, the, the first component is a scenario, two scenario based activities that are will be set by BCS, they're working on them now. It will be an activity based uh, practical exercise in which the first one will be about analyzing the data and the second one will be about visualizing and presenting the data and then they'll get a discussion with their assessor. On level four, it's a lot more complex. Uh, the, the expectation is that the, the learner will bring to the uh, gateway process, the EPA process, a brief, a project brief that has been discussed and planned with the employer, a live project that they will be working on in work. So there'd be a minimum of four weeks where they're actually working on this project. It's live and that will then be assessed by the BCS assessor and there will be a, uh, there will need to be product evidence and a report which will then be discussed and with questions asked from the assessor about that, that, that product. The main difference between the, the current standards that we're on and the new standards and these are the new standards is that the knowledge skills and behaviours um, will all be assessed in 
two different two different ways. As Julie said before, there's no longer any uh, formal vendor exams or, or knowledge module exams to assess the knowledge and behaviour. They've now been embedded in the, the two assessment processes. So there's knowledge, skills and behaviour that will be embedded in the portfolio in which we will help support and show you how to showcase that. And there is knowledge, skills and behaviours that need to be shown in either the scenario demonstrations or the work-based project. We're going to support the employer with how they can create the um, work-based project. There'll be some, some support there in what needs to be set and things like that. So we'll be supporting with that. And I'm sure BCS will have some resources. We're just waiting for all the resources to come and we'll be um, running on that. Now, the level three, it's focused on an introductory to analytics. So this is where um, you may think, right, well, I need to create reports. I need to um, analyze some data. I've been asked to do this. And we've always used Excel. It's what we know. It's it's everything that we've known. Right, OK. But what we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to use these industry relevant tools for analytics. So what we're going to teach you on level three is, OK, you're going to come in with some Excel. We're going to teach you the advanced Excel. So we're going to use the advanced tool pack for trends, regression, testing, ANOVAs, getting you to terms with correlation, what covariance is, and having a look at the, the power pivot and data management, how you do data and a cleansing, cleansing last data sets within Excel. You can do databasing within Excel. Then, so that's your manipulation. Then we're going to show you how to use, sorry, that's my big Ben going off, how to use visualization tools. So you may be aware of Power BI and Tableau. We're going to show you how to use those. At level four, there's an expectation that you already know something and we do look at the advanced. At level three, we're going to show you how to use them from scratch. So it's very much taking a data set putting it into these two pieces of software and showing you how you can then present your dashboards, present your reports in a dynamic fashion. And we're also going to teach you how to use database co and coding. So we're going to be using um, a little bit of SQL. There's going to be Python and R Studio there and how you can use that with your data sets to create the outputs that you require. Level four, as I said, there is an expectation that you know some of this, although currently we are teaching people how to do it, but we would like the differentiation between startup and moving into advanced tools. And that's what level four is about. It's advanced linear regression and how to do uh, drop lines and clusterings and fuzzy works, advanced tools within Power BI and how to move that on, and advanced tools in SQL and R Studio, looking at item response theory, standard deviations, and advanced prediction forecasting. So it is foundation and basic, and then advanced moving on. That's the main difference between level three and level four, and those are things that we'll be teaching you. Okay, I think if we can have the next slide. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jeanette. Um, yeah, thank you. So, um, what we're going to do is just take you through what the ideal kind of candidate looks like for that is best suited to this apprenticeship. Um, so what we've broken that down into is gold, silver and bronze. Um, all are fine to come on programme. Um, we just thought we'd give you an idea as to what that would look like. So uh, our gold, typical gold candidate would have works within a data team or, or works solely with data um, on the either on the level three or four. Um, and would be have a keen interest in maths, but also have been educated to at least a level three in maths. OK, so that's what gold looks like. Um, the candidate will be really interested in progressing their career um, and really interested in, in packages such as L, SQL, R and Python. Now, if we're looking on the next slide at our silver and bronze um, yeah, thank you, our silver and bronze ideal candidate. Um, so if we particularly pay your attention to the bronze, so um, even if you're not aligned to a data team, it doesn't matter, you can still uh, join the, the programme. What's essential is the 
the duties and tasks and activities that you do within your role and whether those meet the, the criteria of the apprenticeship, okay? So you've got a vested interest in your CBD, so the, the learner and the candidate is motivated to progress uh, their career. Um, minimum in maths and English, you should have had a C or above. Um, and even if you have um, on the level three minimal exposure to the analytics within your role, that's fine because we can build that as long as you have the exposure within your role to build on that and move into um, SQL or Python potentially. And it's very similar to the level four, but just at an advanced level. So on a level four, you know, you would be very really interested in using data tools, but um, use a uh, very interested in progressing your knowledge, skills and behaviours to a more intermediate level. Okay, thank you. We can move on to the next slide now, James. Okay, that's back to me. So that's our ideal candidate. Now, we can't have an ideal candidate without having an ideal organisation. They work hand in hand. We found that learners only um, progress really, really well with the massive support from the employers and their managers. So our ideal organisation of gold is managers are engaged and actively mental with the learners and attend meetings. So they're actually concerned with the fact that the learner needs to have this software and needs to have this exposure. And if there is a part of the job role where there isn't, it could be a tiny bit that they've not exposure, where can the manager move them in the team of the department in order to allow that exposure over a period of time for that learner to practice those skill set to then produce the evidence for it. So that's so the manager is involved in overseeing the, the apprentice and making sure that they have that exposure to be able to utilize those skill sets. They can support technically. And that's quite important actually because um, when we have um, some technical conversations, the managers need to know so they know that where the learner needs to go, how to stretch a learner. Those managers that know the background actually can stretch that learner a little bit further and give them more job roles and more things to, to manipulate the data in the way that they, the learner wants to do and needs to do. The culture it promotes apprenticeships, promotes CPD, promotes further progression. That is really, really important. For us, Silva, managers are engaged and actively mentoring, but maybe they can't afford to have so much time or to have a sole mentor for that learner, but they are still involved in overseeing and making sure that the culture promotes apprenticeship and that the exposure is there for that learner. And then bronze, we still have uh, some access to analytical tools, but uh, may not be utilised within the job role, but we have the time to be able to put that in place in that 14 months to be able to manoeuvre that apprentice to get that exposure and to get that support. Obviously, we're looking for golds and silvers, but if you um, know that you're in that bronze somewhere, we can then engage the managers to try to support and um, move that forward. It's about bringing the employers in to the 21st, 22nd century. Excel is what we've always known. That's last millennia. We have tools for the next millennia moving forward. And that's the tools that are really needed for the learners to actually prepare and get the data that the employers are looking for in the way that they're looking for. So it's a two for one really. We can teach the learner, but we also need to teach and support the employer to be able to facilitate that learning and to get that data in that output, that dynamic, sexy output that is required. Okay, I think we're on to the next slide, please. And that's, um, oh, Questions and answers. Lovely. Thank you very much, Jeanette and Julie. Really enjoyed that. James, I believe we've had a, a few questions. But I think kind of conscious of time, I think we're going to reach out direct to those people to uh, to give them that answer. And, and, and obviously, we will be sending out this recording uh, tomorrow, I, I believe, on, on that side. So, uh, so thank you very much. Correct. Thank you very much, James. We've gone to the next slide. We're going to wrap up. So um, the conversation... Uh, it doesn't need to stop here. Uh, if you'd like to speak with us more around this topic or around apprenticeships in general, uh, you can reach us on the number and email on the screen or you can reach out to your account manager. Um, so we do these bi-monthly, uh, these webinars. Our next webinar is going to be on the 29th of July uh, with our new information communications technician apprenticeship going live. 
we thought it'd be a good time to discuss diversity within IT. So please join us then. And finally, there will be a short survey once this webinar closes. So we'd appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to give your feedback. Uh, if you found this interesting, please spread the word. Uh, and if there's a topic you'd like us to debate in the future, please let us know. Uh, on behalf of all of us at Just IT, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and we hope you have a fantastic day. Take care.